no man does his work alone, and I wrote a little insert that you all have that you can read at your leisure that talks about some of the people that I collaborated with while I did my work, so I won't go through that any further here. I'll just, if you don't mind, I'll just jump into my, my presentation. <clears throat> so, so in this talk, I'll try to provide a, a long-term perspective on the issues we face in making water safe, making drinking water safe. I'll take us back in the past to the middle of the 19th century. David already did some of that. We'll talk about what happened since then. And then we'll talk about the new age the next generation must face. The title of the talk is How Safe is Safe in the Treatment of Drinking Water. So the connection between drinking water and disease was established in 1854 by John Snow, a noted physician in Victorian England. Using maps and interviews of the affected population, Snow connected the cholera outbreak in London at the time to drinking water taken from the Broad Street well. During the 19th century and much of the 20th century that followed, the focus in drinking water then was on the treatment of water to prevent waterborne disease. Diseases like cholera and typhoid fever, showing the little organisms that that we all love that are responsible for that. Here are some early personalities in that effort. I've just picked a few among many. Tom Hoxley, a civil engineer in Victorian England, who was an advocate of continuous pressurization of water uh, systems to prevent contamination. George Fuller, who developed rapid sand filtration to purify the water. John Leal, the first to introduce chlorination in the United States to disinfect the water, and Abel Woolman, who played a pivotal role in the adoption of chlorination nationwide, as, as we mentioned earlier. Data on the rapid decline of death rates in the U.S. in the first half of the 20th century, like this CDC data shown here, are often cited to demonstrate that drinking water treatment was one of the greatest engineering achievements of the 20th century. By the 1960s, when I graduated from high school, it might even be said <clears throat> that our public health officials took comfort in just a little bit of a chlorine smell in the drinking water. It was a sign that their water was free from microbial disease. <laughs> that chlorine smell was a happy moment. <laughs> in fact, you could say safe drinking water became a symbol that a civilization had made it into the modern age. But the modern age also brought other problems with it. Safe drinking water was only one of the great achievements of science and engineering in the 20th century. Another great achievement was the development of our chemical industry. We invented a lot of chemicals to make our life easier. DuPont even coined the slogan, better living through chemistry. Let me give you some examples of the important chemicals that were invented in the first half of the 20th century. When rubber was in short supply, we invented synthetic rubber, and we still make our tires with it today. I don't have to tell you how important penicillin is. It was discovered in 1928, but making large quantities was a very difficult thing to achieve. But by 1944, uh, in the middle of World War II, we were making millions of doses for our troops. We invented nylon a synthetic fiber that replaced silk in women's stockings. Nylon is both tougher and cheaper than silk. I remember when I was a kid, my mother, you know, nylons were cheaper than silk stockings. But you could only wear a silk stocking once because they were ruined after that. <clears throat> and nowadays, I don't think anybody wears silk. <laughs> DDT, the miracle pesticide. We used it for everything, <clears throat> for lice, pests in the kitchen, elm disease, mosquitoes. I remember my dad spraying it all over the place. <laughs> for me personally, one of the most dramatic was the herbicide Dalpon. Dalpon came out in the mid-1950s when I was a kid. And one of my chores was to pull the crabgrass out of our dichondra lawn. I spent a lot of long, hot, 
summer afternoons in that lawn. I grew up in Southern California. For me personally. Well, so then my Uncle Amos, who was a farmer, told my dad about Dalpon. My dad sprayed Dalpon on the lawn. The stuff killed the crabgrass, <laughs> but it didn't touch the dichondria. I was sold on dichondria. The chemical industry, as you might imagine, was quite proud of these achievements. This ad from Penwall in 1946, or maybe it's 47, is a good example. The text in the ad begins, the great expectations held for DDT have been realized. During 1946, exhaustive scientific studies have shown that when properly applied, DDT kills a host of destructive pests and is a benefactor to all of humanity. And it was true. With all these new chemicals being as powerful as they were, and with human nature being such that it is, you won't be surprised that not everyone saw it the same way. Chemicals that can produce such impressive results were naturally suspect. In 1962, a tipping point came in our national dialogue about these issues when Rachel Carson wrote the book Silent Spring. In that book, she demonstrated that some of the most miraculous of these man-made chemicals, DDT in particular, had significant consequences that had not been anticipated. Carson's book stood the test of science and captured the imagination of the world community. It was the analytical sciences that brought the issue to drinking water. In the late 1960s, analytical techniques vastly improved. Particularly important was the gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. Using these instruments, and as one shown here, using these instruments, EPA conducted surveys of the nation's water supplies. And they found evidence of chemical spills, which they were looking for, but more important, they also found, perhaps more important, they also found that when we use chlorine to disinfect the water, it caused chemical byproducts, like chloroform. And later on, volatile organic chemicals, which we call VOCs, were also found in groundwater basins all over the nation. When we found these disinfection byproducts of VOCs, we faced some important decisions. On the one hand, these compounds were found at very low levels. We hadn't found them until we had these fancy instruments. Also, and this is important, the evidence that they represented a health risk was what I call second-order science. There was no direct evidence, or certainly very little direct evidence, of health consequences from human exposure. Rather, there was evidence in studies from animals exposed to much higher levels of chemicals. And that evidence had to be extrapolated across one species to another, and across orders of magnitude of concentration, and across decades of exposure in order to figure out what, what its impact would be. <clears throat> It'd be a long time before this issue was settled science. Also, the risks imputed were generally small when compared to the risks that the population ordinarily engages in during everyday life. The decisions we make all the time. There were also concerns on the other side of the ledger, though, even though there was ambiguity about the level of risk where the customer is concerned, the drinking water customer, the risk is involuntary. So it becomes a matter of public trust. We're making decisions on behalf of the public. Also, there was evidence that the public was concerned about the issue. And finally, some important figures in the industry began to advocate that these chemicals be removed. Abel Woolman, who I mentioned before, was one of the most visible of these figures. Abel was in his late 80s at the time, but believe me, he was still very persuasive. So there was a lot of debate. <clears throat> but in the end, the nation spent the rest of the 20th century changing disinfection to prevent disinfection byproducts and implementing super fun, uh, super fun programs to clean up our groundwaters nationwide. So you might ask, in light of all this fuzzy information about the risks of the chemicals, how do we decide what levels we would achieve? Well, it's important to understand these regulations were written at a time 
you can tell I practiced, because it's all recorded. It's important to understand these regulations written at a time when the official outlook of Washington, D.C. was still reflected by the Delaney Amendment, which was an FDA regulation that banned any chemicals, any chemical added to food, uh, which could induce cancer in animals, so, or man, man or animals. So, so for carcinogens, any amount was unacceptable. No amount was acceptable. So in the operating this environment, EPA proposed an interesting strategy. They proposed a maximum contaminant level goal and a maximum contaminant level. The maximum contaminant level was the enforceable level. And for carcinogens, the goal would be zero. But the MCL would be set as close to the goal as feasible. But of course, there were a lot of debates about what level is feasible. So to help this resolve this issue in the debate, EPA offered that an important consideration determining what's feasible would be the practical quantification limit, which would be the lowest level that you could reliably measure. <clears throat> so the lowest feasible level for an MCL would then be the PQL. So from that time on, all carcinogens, the, MC, the MCL has been set at the PQL. In essence, through the artifice of this practical quantification limit, we set a goal of zero. No contamination can be measurable. <clears throat> but as the nation struggled to address volatile organic uh, chemicals, DVPs, as we went on in those decades to deal with it, the science of water analysis continued to advance. In 1997, just as we approached the end of the 20th century, German scientists uh, reported the presence of a new group of chemicals in um, European rivers and streams. And then in 2002, the um, U.S. Geological Survey published a national uh, study showing these same chemicals were widespread in U.S. waterways as well. Some of these chemicals were residual drugs we take to protect our health and that we then pass on the environment in our urine. Others were residuals of personal care products like perfume, insect repellent, or sunscreen, caffeine and coffee. Others were natural hormones like estradiol or, eth or synthetic hormones like ethanyl estradiol, which we take for birth control. Some were sweeteners we use to sweeten up our sugar-free soft drinks like um, sucralose, or ace sulfame K. Now we get a new thing to worry about. <clears throat> These emerging chemicals occur at the part per trillion level, a thousand fold lower than the DVPs and VOCs we found four decades ago. Again, the levels are low enough, it's hard to know the best course of action. As we work to meet this challenge, it's becoming clear that resolving it will require resources more than just our drinking water industry. It may require that we build a new consensus about what it means to have safe water. These trace organic chemicals, I would argue, in our environment are harbingers of a new age that we're now entering. This new age has two characteristics that are important to understand. The first is the rapid expansion of the Earth's human population, which is having impacts that um, are beyond those we've experienced before. And the second is that even more rapid impact or expansion of worldwide commerce. As the level of our commerce continues to increase along with our population, indeed, much faster than the population increases, the detritus of our civilization uh, will become increasingly present in the environment around us. Trace organic chemicals in drinking water are only one form this debris takes. We see evidence of it in the smog in Southern California. That started to appear in the late 40s, early 50s. We saw evidence of acid rain in the 70s, the ozone layer in the 80s, and of course the global warming we talked about earlier today. But where drinking water is concerned, it is the accumulation of these trace organic chemicals in water that has become the big issue. For the moment, our strategy continues to be to treat them below the level of detection, and we've got some great hardware to do it. But the improvement of, sci of the science of water analysis is rapid and inexorable. So we're able to find this chemical to try to start our civilization at lower and lower levels, and increasingly at places we've never been able to find them before. 
Since 1970, I would argue analytical technology has been the fastest growing area of water science. This chart shows a crude plot of the history of detections for measuring trace organics in water during the course of my career and well beyond. The idea is we can make our own equivalent of Moore's law. So, you know, Moore was the guy who said that the number of transistors on a microchip doubles every two years. Well, you know, you could say that our new law would be the detection of trace organics drops by half every two and a half years. And so if you plot that out, we'll be at one picogram per liter by the 2035, one molecule per liter by the end of the century. I don't know where we'll go after that. So what does it mean? Well, increasingly, I think we know something is there when we don't know what it's being there at that level means. And so the question is, when is the water pure? When is it safe? This leads us, I think, to an essential question in this new age. Do we need some kind of new discussion about risk, about when water is safe? But we have problems discussing risk. Over the past four decades here in the U.S., we have developed and refined a formal risk assessment process to help us address these unknowns. Scientific reviewers have weighed in, weighed in many of them, uh, much brighter than I, many times, and a lot of formal procedures have developed for testing and extrapolating the test data from lab animals to people, from days of exposure, decades of exposure, from exposure of grams per liter to exposure picograms per liter and so on. <clears throat> but our risk assessment process can't keep up with the new chemicals being generated by commerce. The process is too low, slow, and it's too expensive. We're finding ourselves with an increasingly longer list of unregulated chemicals of unknown significance. As a result, inadequate guidance is presently available to help the public gain perspective on these chemicals. We operate from the perspective of fear. To address this dilemma, the Europeans have adopted a precautionary approach. Much like the approach we took to the DPPs when Amber Woman weighed in three decades ago. Necessarily, essentially, the principle states that evidence of harm rather than definitive proof of harm should prompt policy. But of course, it's much more complicated than that. And too much precaution would prevent uh, progress, and we certainly don't want to prevent progress. So the whole idea is pretty controversial. This cartoon, I think, does a good job of capturing the extremes. Some would say Europe has carried precaution to an extreme. How might we achieve better balance? Well, I'd propose four guidelines we could consider in this new era. One, I think we all have to agree, we prefer that we, we not have these man-made chemicals in our environment or in our drinking water. That's the place to start. Second, we should recognize that this first principle is not universally achievable. Therefore, we need a screen to help us make intelligent investments and decisions before the subtle science is available. And third, in the treatment of drinking water and wastewater, we should seek continuous improvement. Implementing affordable uh, broad spectrum treatment technologies as they become available. And fourth, we should find substitutes for man made chemical compounds that persist through our treatment processes. When I say we, I don't mean our industry, I mean our nation. We need to find substitutes, like we did for detergents, like we did for C uh, CFCs. <clears throat> but those things that persist in the water environment, and we should give priority to those that have demonstrated health effects. I said we need some kind of screen to help us guide our, us in our investments. I think perhaps de minimis risk would be a useful place to start with that screen. Of course, the problem is that while we all agree on the principle of de minimis risk or de minimis things, there's often strong disagreement as to what level of risk is in fact de minimis. So the specifics are not something we just resolve with science. It has to be decided by some accepted authority, a regulator, a court of law, uh, perhaps the National Academies. But there's reason for hope. 
our regulators already use a variety of de minimis criteria in managing risk. And regulators also in the world do also. It's an example, the FDA generally treats a lifetime risk of one in a million as de minimis in their regulations. More than that, over the past five or six decades, the developed world has built a sophisticated infrastructure of con uh, for the consideration of minimus risk where chemicals are concerned. And these are reflected in guidelines, advisories, regulations regarding human exposure to chemicals, medicines, agriculture, food, water, and a number of different areas. And they're used by recognized authorities like the EPA, FDA, WHO, the Institute of Medicine. And it, it seems to me that perhaps these could serve as a launching point for a more comprehensive set of de minimis criteria. So what about those microbiologic contaminants we started with when we began our efforts in water treatment 160 years ago? Are they important anymore? This chart shows the top eight illnesses in the U.S. And this is compiled by CDC. All but one are gastrointestinal diseases that, are, that could be transmitted by water. Today, these diseases are primarily spread in food and first-person contact, but it's pretty evident there are still plenty of gastrointestinal diseases around in the population, and getting them in our drinking water would be a great way to spread them around to a lot more people. And um, this is what seems like is going to happen in the Philippines in the next several weeks. I pose to take a moment to go through the exercise of characterizing these organisms as trace organic compounds, torques, that were designed by nature. And, and try to provide a little bit of an engineer's perspective on this by comparing them with the, the trace organics that nature has made with the trace organics we've made. So this fellow was refreshing himself with a nice glass of water. Let's compare how the presence of two chemicals might affect him. First, let's look at NDMA, nitrosodimethylamine. This is a man-made chemical EPA has on its contaminant candidate list. California's public health goal is three nanograms per liter, three times 10 to the minus uh, grams per liter. <clears throat> so let's compare NDMA to the norovirus. Norovirus is the most common cause. It's the top thing on that list I showed you. Uh, the LD50, the, the dose that would cause half of us to get sick, is about 2,700 genome copies, so say 2,700 molecules. Now let's uh, put these on an equivalent basis. First, NDMA, 3 nanograms per liter, is about 2.4 times 10 to the 13th molecules per liter. And then norovirus, so um, in molecules, that's about it's 2,700 molecules per liter for the LD50, so that comes to uh, 2.2 times 10 to the minus 17 grams per liter. <clears throat> Chemists might suggest we use moles per liter. Now I ask you to note the concentrations for NDMA on the left are about, all about 8 to 10 order of magnitude lower than the concentrations for, for the norovirus. Higher, I'm sorry, higher. Than the higher than the concentrations for norovirus. That's, that means they're 100 million to 10 billion times different. Now let's look at the consequences. First, NDMA. Estimates are, if you're exposed to three nanograms per liter of NDMA in your drinking water every day for 70 years, your chance of getting cancer increases by one in a million. Remember, your chance of getting cancer is about one in four anyway. <laughs> if you happen to be one of those one in a million, uh, your, the fate is yours alone. The rest of your family will be just fine. Their risks are still just one in four. <laughs> For norovirus, if you drink this water, the concentration or, uh, with this concentration of norovirus in it, you have a 50-50 chance of 48 hours of acute gastroenteritis. Get it bad, we're talking the full circuit thing, intense vomiting, explosive diarrhea, where you'll be sitting on the loo with your head in the sink. <laughs> and in the following days, unless your hygiene is near superhuman, several members of your family will have the same experience. 
So as I pointed out earlier, by all measures of concentration, LD50 for norovirus is 100 to 10 million times lower than the de minimis concentration for norovirus. Yet the consequence of exposure to the norovirus seems awfully unpleasant. I think this is a special caution for portable use. Uh, if, if we believe portable use in our future, and I, I believe it is, we need to continue to invest in our understanding of the science of pathogens and their measurement and control, because it's going to be the most important thing we worry about. So let me summarize. Our old paradigm for safe water was to use natural water sources unaffected by the activity of man. Trace organic compounds we're now seeing in our water are harbingers of a new age where the growth of population and commerce and improvements in analytical chemistry make that natural water paradigm unworkable. Where trace organic compounds are concerned, we need a new paradigm for safe water. Ultimately, conventional regulations need to be expanded to address this sort of thing, but in the meantime, benchmarks might e exist, do exist, which might be used to develop de minimis guidelines. Finally, it's the trace organic chemicals that capture our imagination. But I think it's the pathogens that are the most important health risk. Thank you. I don't know if I take questions or we're done. <laughs> if, if you do, um, I apologize. I won't be able to see your hands. All I can see is the light on my face. <laughs> or comments? <laughs> Congratulations, Clark Prize recipient. So I do want to uh, turn your attention to the, ca the card that Rhodes had written, and it's in your program. And what I thought was in interesting about the, pro the, uh, the note was the number of people that you acknowledged. Uh, Perry, Perry McCarty, Mike Cavanaugh, Larry Leon, Isham Nall. Nam, who are here, previous Clark Prize recipients, Jim Morgan, Charlie Amelia, George Sabanagloss, John Crittenden is here, Carrie Howe, who is here. Um, but you mentioned your family. And Liz, it's been great to get to know you over the years, and thank you for coming, and it's great to have you here. Shane and Brian, thank you, and your wives, uh, Celine and Lindy, who I haven't met, but thanks. It's good to have you here. And. Um, I want to uh, thank Jim Swinton, uh, as always, and Morton Smith. It's good to have you here representing the foundation and your families. It's good to have you here. Uh, the Joan Irvine Smith and Nathalie Richardson Clark Foundation has been a great supporter of NWRI for over 20 years now, and we truthfully, honestly appreciate that support. I want to thank again the Trussell family for attending. All the previous Clark Prize, Clark Prize recipients, it's great to have you come back every year. I don't know if people tell you that, but it is. It's great to see you. And I want to mention NWRI staff, Brandy, Gina, and Roxana. We couldn't do this without you. <clears throat> we had great support from our volunteer students. As always, you're always welcome. And I want to mention our NWRI agencies. We had a number of board members come, and that's fantastic. It was good to have you here. So thank you for a great evening. I appreciate all you coming, and we'll see you next year. Thank you. Thank you.